Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Lawson. Uh, the slides are just coming up now. My name is uh, David Lawson. Uh, I am the uh, head of Ag, Food and uh, the Consumer Branch, as well as the Export Supply Chain Services here at Austrade. Um, good afternoon and welcome to this, the final of the Export Supply Chain Services Industry Briefings. Uh, I'll be hosting today's virtual event and uh, we warmly welcome you all. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that in the tradition of the uh, Indigenous owners of the lands on, from which I'm presenting, the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and, and recalling that for over 65,000 years this has been a trading nation and as uh, the Indigenous uh, forebears who were the custodians of this land, entered the land, they welcomed each other and traded. And in that same spirit of trading and passing on information, I'd like to acknowledge Elders um, past, present and emerging. And uh, in that same spirit, I hope that we can enjoy an opportunity to pass on information about, about trading. Uh, and that's what we're here uh, to talk about. And, um, you know, as, as we've noticed over the last year, supply chains are well on the road to recovery post-COVID-19 and all the related shocks and, and, uh, and operating conditions. Things are stabilising uh, and as such, uh, the export supply chain service that we've been providing for this last uh, uh, 12 months will be winding down uh, on the 30th of June uh, as planned. Um, so as the program ends this week, um, this will be the last briefing and uh, and. Uh, I'm sure it will be one of the best. So, uh, look, I, I just wanted to um, uh, welcome Michael Byrne, who will be the keynote speaker again. He's the principal for Export Supply Chain Services. He's going to pro provide us with the final update uh, on the current operating environment and the outlook for supply chains going forward. Uh, we'll go into some question and answers, and, and I'd like to... Uh, draw everybody's attention. As is usually the case, we use Slido. You can use the app on your uh, on your phone or slido.com and hashtag ESCS. Uh, and at any time through the through the process, if a thought comes to mind, a question you want to ask, uh, please uh, enter it in there. Uh, and for other participants following along, if you if you like the question, um, and, and um, put a um, acknowledgement there. We'll uh, we'll put it to the top of the pile for the questions uh, when we get to the Q and A session. Um, but because it's the last time, I also have some special questions that I want to put to Michael. So we look forward to getting some uh, uh, some interesting uh, and frank feedback from from Michael uh, as well at the end. Um, so. Uh, just to, as a, a final note, just for everybody's reference, uh, we are recording this. Um, uh, if you or colleagues do need to to see a, a, um, a to review the session today, uh, it will be recorded. It will be on our website. And uh, with that, I will throw to you, Michael, and uh, ask if you, if you could uh, kick off, perhaps, with giving us a state of uh, the, the state of play for air freight. Yep. So thank you, David. And good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> and um, for those people who I saw yesterday at the Simplified Trade Task Force Summit, thank you for attending that. And we will uh, continue to talk about that later today. Um, so flight capacity pre-COVID, we were last week 89% uh, in the week ending 18th to the 6th. This is a marked increase from the depths of the COVID pandemic um, where we only had 10%. So three years ago, um, when IFAM originally started and then we moved two years, two and a half years later into ESKI. Uh, the original position was we had 10% of pre-COVID. Now we have close to 90%. Um, and some markets are stronger um, than they were pre-COVID. India, there's more than 100% of flights. Um, Europe's extremely strong. Um, we're seeing really strong connections with parts of Asia, etc. But there have been real changes in the makeup and I will get to that. Average rate 
average worldwide rate increases or rates are currently 38% lower than this time last year at an average rate US around the world of $2.43, although they are significantly above pre-COVID levels. As we've always said, even from the very beginning of COVID, we never thought that they would go back, particularly outbound of Australia because they were marginally costed. Airlines worked out during COVID elasticity in market and elasticity of our products. Products tend out of Australia to be of high value. They worked out that they no longer had to uh, do marginal costing of their freight and that they turned it into a, their own significant profit centre. If you recall, 74, 75% of all freight that comes into Australia comes into the belly of a passenger plane, which is very different to the rest of the world, which is about 50%. And those, those commercial airlines that are doing passengers have made a significant... Uh, investment in those abilities to do freight in the bodies of their bellies of their commercial planes. Um, we've had, had major, as we know, increases in fuel. We'll talk about that separately. Um, and the continuation of a million barrels a day from OPEC plus one reductions, which are the third time that that's been done, continues to keep prices higher. That when, when air traffic and commercial planes somewhere between, depending on the plane, the configuration of flight, 24, 25, 26%, 27% of its costs are fuel. Uh, those fuel prices are incredibly important as an input. Uh, we've just done a final analysis in March, first March 2019 to March 23 on freight prices, air freight. Um, and they are still on the East Coast two to four times pre-COVID. Now, they have been that way now for nearly a year. Um, yes, there are spot, rights, spot prices lower than that. Western Australia freight price is sitting at three to four and a half times. Fuel flights and fuel carriers with Perth particularly being dominated by Singapore Airlines and its affiliates. We don't see those prices changing. Um, even if when we get to 100%, um, I still don't think those prices will change now. I think that airlines have still looking to repair their balance sheets, still looking at large capital investments <clears throat> into equipment, particularly to reduce fuel um, inputs and long-term going to SAF. Um, so I don't see those prices changing materially. There's no such thing as ever going back to one. China and Hong Kong flight recovery. Um, China from 36, we're up to about 52%. Uh, Hong Kong at about 55%, but they are the lowest in real terms of all our outbound destinations out of this country. Um, there's a whole lot of geopolitical reasons for that, a whole lot of other reasons for that. I, I won't get bogged down into that. Um, I don't see that improving much in the next three months. There are some expectations that in early next year around Chinese New Year that, that those flight numbers will start to improve. As I said, 80% of air freight is carried in the bellies of passenger flight, passenger planes. Um, what the big issue there is, historically prior to COVID uh, on long haul, 90% um, of long haul planes and international planes uh, in a, coming to Australia and out of Australia were wide body. Um, that has changed materially. Um, it is currently sitting at 60-40. So we had 90% wide body to 10, which allowed enormous extra capacity for pass uh, for freight. With that real change, 90-10 to 60-40, uh, due to the cost of fuel and the maximised plane yields and the reduced cabin crew, after so much cabin crew was let go during COVID, there is less capacity. So even if we're at 90% of plane numbers, we're not at 90% of tonnage. Um, and that won't be changed anytime soon. If you look at Boeing um, and Airbus construction with 787s, uh, A350s, etc. if you look at, and we did this for you, and it was in one of our, our snapshot, the order book's out 10 years. 
Um, so it's a long order book on what's going to happen there. Um, I think the other big thing is, and I was talking to a couple of people yesterday from the airline industry, and again, we were talking to them, and I appreciate their candour um, about where they are in their journey of getting back to 100%. And both those people I spoke to yesterday said that the planes weren't the issue now. It was cabin crew and tech crew. That a lot of tech crew, and these weren't Australian airlines, the, a lot of tech crew were let go and retrenched. They took early retirement. They took redundancy packages. They went back to their home country and, and they've decided not to come back and do long haul. Um, and that there's still two, three years of training uh, to get tech crew. One of those people yesterday said, they're finding it very hard to get the tech crew they used to. They used to get a lot of tech crew out of Western military, um, particularly US Air Force, et cetera, et cetera. And that is just not happening. And we probably can understand why. Uh, the militaries are paying really big bonuses to keep people uh, in the military so they don't have to train pilots. So we're at 90% of air, floor, uh, air numbers, airline numbers. That is 90% of tonnage. On the East Coast, we're at two to four times, maybe 1.85 times on a good day. Um, we do get spot rates under that. I don't see that changing. Three to four and a half times out of Perth with Singapore Airlines dominating out of there. Um, I don't see that changing. Uh, long term, we need more long haul wide body. That is restricted by... Um, particularly aircraft production with Boeing and Airbus, A350-787s, and then we still have tech crew issues. But infinitely better than where we were, where when we're at 10% uh, East Coast prices were 13 times. If I move on to sea freight, um, look, there's been some really good things about sea freight, um, apart from what's on the screen, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, as you know, uh, Switzer and the MUA did do their um, come to an agreement after maybe two years of negotiation and the six year six months of uh, a stop by the Fair Work Commission. Sixty two percent of the sixty three percent of the workforce voted that up of a new collective agreement. It still hasn't gone to and been stamped at Fair Work. Or do know as we saw in the media that um, the MUA were against the agreement. Hopefully that nothing will come of that. Um, I think the other big issue is the 14th of June, which uh, in principle agreement has been done with on the West Coast with the longshoremen for 24,000 workers. That has also gone on for a long period of time and that would have been uh, a real burden on um, the global sea freight movement. Uh, particularly with Los Angeles, Vancouver, uh, the Alameda Corridor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it is good that that has been done. Hopefully that will be um, concluded shortly. It's a new six-year contract, uh, ending 13 months of hard, hard talks there. It's been signed off by all uh, the major parties, including the, uh, the national government there. Um, but that could have been a real dampener on, on what was going to happen. Global reliability has improved again by only 1.7% to 64.2%, 29% improvement on the same period last year. We uh, have improved in Oceania Asia region from 38% to 51%. It is still lower um, than the rest of the major trading lanes, particularly China to US West Coast and China to Europe. Um, in April, delays dropped again to 4.34 days. Um, some better weather and some improvements in difficult ports around the world, um, particularly New Zealand has improved slightly. Cancellations, there were only 30, 30 out of 750 global sailings for the last month. Um, it was a 4% cancellation rate. Although, as we're seeing, uh, Shipping companies are starting to beach more ships and retire ships over that 30-year mark. Um, 
That's a reflection on slowing trade movement, but also on the new emissions requirements on ships. So older ships can't uh, comply with the new sulphur content. Cancellations that are among the latest since the pandemic began, reflecting balance between supply and demand. Import ocean freight rates have collapsed, as we know, and fallen significantly since their peak in 2021. 2021. Uh, but in some cases, depending on some lanes, still remain higher than pre-pandemic levels. Despite those heavy declines, ocean freight rates remain high for Australian exporters due to strong demand, high fuel costs, equipment limitations, particularly refrigeration. And I know a couple of you continue to write to me about that. <clears throat> but also the strength of agricultural exports, cotton on the East Coast, uh, grain, which has been been put in containers because of a shortage of bulk grain um, due to just the severe uh, strength of grain exports, uh, CBH, Grain Corps, uh, Vatera, uh, Bungie have all announced uh, record uh, offtakes. And, and as some of you would have seen, uh, the mega merger of Bungie and Vatiri uh, proposed to make 118 billion US dollar giant in grain. So grain is extremely strong. That is keeping export prices up uh, and other export uh, commodities out of Australia that can go into containers ha ha have been keeping those prices up. And I don't see that changing much. Um, recent records of volume, commodities, grain, coal, um, but predominantly cotton, um, wheat and meat and a few other things are going to keep those prices up and then the shipping lines are out of balance on that. Ocean freight pricing, um, yes, they have come down materially, but I don't see that on exports moving much at the moment until unless we have a weaker agricultural crop, which... Let's hope we don't do that. It's been one of the strengths of the Australian economy over COVID. Uh, overall, agriculture has gone from about 64 billion, I think, to about 89 billion, well on its way to 100 billion uh, by 2030 as per the Ag 2030 program. So the key message is reliability is increasing, delays are decreasing, shipping conditions are returning to pre-COVID. We saw Maersk announce that... Uh, as a big reflection of the changes there, that it's not going to make 31 billion US dollars this year, it might make three, and that a, major, a large part of the non MERS branded business, for example, such as FITSA, uh, is on the chopping block for sale as they restructure that business. Uh, in balancing container availability persist, there's been no great improvement in uh, particularly refrigeration and the container mix. Fuel. We we'll talk about a couple of other things uh, along the way here. Fuel, jet fuel prices for Asia and Oceania were last week eighty nine dollars sixty five a barrel. Uh, week ending eighteenth of June, that was about 07 of one percent lower week on week. Uh, it's twenty nine percent lower than the same period in twenty twenty two. OPEX production cuts uh, of nearly three million barrels. All of that hasn't actually happened but it is possible that it will happen. Uh, OPEC plus one uh, are trying to reverse that decline. Um, it's hard to know. I'm not a speculator. I, I don't know where fuel will go. I, I can't imagine that with Russia being the largest producer of distillate from heavy fuel oil, uh, that the events on the weekend were good for fuel prices either, but we shall see. Uh, Labor availability costs, very low unemployment um, and competition from international employees is impacting the availability of employees. Qantas has noted uh, that it is losing pilots to the US um, and so has Virgin. So there is a real shortage of tech crew. Um, Labor, I think there was, I was in the US for holidays recently. I think uh, for the first time they had 10 million job vacancies. Wow. 10 million job vacancies. So if we don't think uh, there'll be competition for employees and, and real labour costs going up, 
Uh, I think we're kidding ourselves. We're, unemployment here is still only 3.5%, regardless of 12 interest rate increases in rail. Labor costs are likely to increase further. Uh, we know that DP World, for instance, have their industrial instrument that uh, starts in at Port Botany, I think, in November. We know that there's cleaning contracts and other security contracts up for uh, renewal at the majority of airports. And then apart from the three or four big transport companies, there is a lot of industrial instruments in the TWU sector that come up on the 1st of July. Um, I think that the TWU have announced that they're after 5% plus a $3,000 uh, cost of living allowance uh, emergency payment on top of the 5%, which makes their claim 8.2%. And that's on top of superannuation going up on the 1st of January. Not that it would affect toll in Fox Australia, um, Australia Post, because they're already at 1425 to 16.5% on their super. Mm -hmm. Supply chain vol volatility. Um, June marks three months of the... The GEP, Global Supply Chain Volatility Index, below zero, um, which had not happened before uh, the last three months, all the way back to COVID. It tracks global demand conditions, shortages, transportation costs, inventories and backlogs. When it is greater than zero, supply chains are overstretched. And when it is zero, it is underutilised, slightly below zero. So globally... Uh, supply chains supposedly are not now stretched uh, for capacity. Reductionly, reductions there have mostly been driven by normalising conditions and less demand with consumer offtakes being lower. That uh, particularly reflects depressed purchasing activity in Europe and North America and companies focusing on clearing inventory uh, to reduce their working capital in their balance sheets. Net zero, uh, the global airline industry has set a goal of net zero emissions by 2050. Sustain sustainable Aviation Fuel, SAF, which is expected to reduce emissions by 53 to 71%, will be the largest driver of these reductions. Qantas and Airbus have announced a US 200 million fund to deliver and develop SAF. Um, and $2 million has been invested in biofuel production facility. We don't have any SAF production in Australia at the moment. There's many people thinking about how that would happen, I believe, whether it's Gladstone, whether it's Sydney, whether it's Port Kembla. I hear something new every day. I don't know. The answer is. Um, but they're really big numbers, aren't they? It's going to give us a 53 to 71% largest driver reduction. Um, but... I think uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. In ocean shipping, the IMO has set a goal of reducing shipping emissions by 40% by 2030 and 70% by 2050. Vessel compliance standards brought in by IMO start on the 1st of January as a mandated step. Um, that means a lot of the fleet has to be turned out or much slower sailings or refitment. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. You're seeing the big shipping companies uh, experimenting. I think a couple of months ago we saw, a, was it a coal or a hydrogen ship, which was a, a Japanese trial, which was actually a sailing ship. Um, we're seeing hydrogen, blue hydrogen. We're seeing a whole lot of different things being used. I think they're in the main, they're experimental and we'll see what, happens. Fuel is going to play a very major part in the ocean freight industry meeting their targets. Green ethanol, another such fuel, but it's not widely available and it's not commercially viable yet. Mm -hmm. But people are experimenting here. Um, there is real cost pressures in the nodes and the modes from fuel and net zero targets. Labour shortages are another massive issue. And if you look at the average age of people in supply chain in Australia, I think it's now over 50. Um, there are lots of moving parts here that probably say to me pricing is not going anywhere but up. It's not coming down uh, because it can't be when fuel is such a big input and labour. So if you're running a trucking company, as we know, depending on the configuration and the application, 
Labor can be between 30% and 70%. And you reverse the fuel number. The lower the Labor, the higher the fuel. The higher the Labor, the lower the fuel. Because the lower the fuel is the less distance, etc., etc. So, um, low, low unemployment numbers mean we're competing hard for people. Low unemployment in the US means that people are highly skilled people are going there for jobs. Uh, fuel three million barrels being cut. And then the, the issues around emissions uh, mean there are other inputs into cost. Um, as I've said from three years ago, I never ever saw that prices would go back to pre-COVID and I think uh, that has played out. And being three minutes early, Good logisticians are early, um, but not by much. Um, that would be the update before, uh, David, we get to either pre-submitted questions or questions Slido on Slido, Slido. Yep. or to each other. Yep, terrific. Uh, can I just um, go back to that previous slide because I'm going to lead off with a question, but just to remind everybody that um, Slido.com, we've got a few questions coming in. Uh, and the hashtag is uh, ESCS. Um, so if you log on to that, there's a couple of questions there. I'll get to those in a minute. But I want to draw your attention to the supply chain volatility uh, um, global, the GEP, the global yep. uh, index there. You said that it's down to zero for the first time in three years. Yep. Uh, well done. Um, but that's the global... Um, that, that's the global um, index. Yes, yeah, it is. You're saying that globally, uh, it's um, it, it's um, supply chains are not stretched. Yeah. Have you got any idea on that for Australia? Where do you reckon we'd be relative to zero? Well, it wouldn't be less than zero. I think, as I said, it's de it's being really driven hard by depressed purchasing activity in Europe and parts of North America. Right. So. They invested enormously in the US, particularly in trucking capability and rail capability. Yeah. And you saw the massive profit, profits of trucking companies like Swift yeah. or um, JB Hunt. You saw CNCP, uh, BNSF, those rail companies, the tier one rail ones, uh, railways making enormous amounts of money. So they invested heavily to build more capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, with consumerism going a bit off, they've got that capacity. Right. Um, we don't have that luxury. Mm. Um, I don't. Although I would say, if you look at, if you look at uh, modern warehouse vacancy rates in Victoria last month, mm. there was only one point four percent vacancy rate. Interesting. So that is why people like Goodman and Logos and others are making such enormous returns mm. because warehousing is so tight. Some of that, I think, is because we've moved from uh, just in time to just in case. So companies are holding more inventory. Mm. Um, hopefully that working capital will come out of those businesses over time because they won't be able to afford them. Um, I don't think Australia is is less than zero. I still think there is some tough points, um, tough modal and nodal points, and our prices are higher as well. Yeah. Our prices are higher, the Australian dollar's weaker, so people are copying it in the neck. Yeah. Um, and we didn't, we didn't, we couldn't build that capacity. Now we don't move as much container freight by rail to lower cost. A lot of it's done here by truck. Yep. So we're definitely not at the same level as North America or Europe. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to a couple of the um, pre-submitted questions and thanks everybody for those questions. And just a reminder, and, and uh, I've seen quite a an uptick in the number of Slido questions, but... Um, a couple of technical ones here, um, and uh, where is it? so refrigeration. Um, so there's an over reliance on active refrigeration yeah. um, for cold chain perishable exports and imports, both there and 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 reefers. 
Um, there are Thai companies exporting pressure sensitive perishables by air without active refrigeration, dry ice or polystyrene. Are there any innovative solutions in Australia that you're aware of? Look, first of all, um, particularly sea freight container, refrigeration containers are still a great difficulty and and that has been a problem since Adam was a little boy and we find that very difficult to change, but to, and also food grade containers out of Australia. And then we're using a lot more food grade containers um, because we, we're loading grain now into, into, <laughs> into containers. Mm. So I think uh, out of Western Australia alone last year, and they run, they run that analysis on the calendar year, over a million tonne went of grain went in food grade containers that the pre year before was nearly zero. Yeah. So that is a lot of extra food containers that are being gobbled up on grain. Uh, we do know also that um, because of real grain sh uh, container shortages of high quality, uh, a lot of cotton's gone out in food grade containers. Yeah. So <laughs> um, that's th those large export numbers and that large agricultural crop the last two years where we've hit two years or three years in a record mm. um, have really made that even more difficult. Uh, refrigeration um, and cold chain uh, discipline is probably not what it should be. Um, it, it is in that pharmacology and medicine and CSL and inbound particularly for grade eight. Um, but we have heard of lapses in cold chain discipline. Mm. Um, I think that is again about new people coming into the business, uh, time pressures, less, less aircraft, less wide-bodied aircraft, um, and then a lack of equipment. Mm. Um, I, I don't think that's changing i think though that people need to be very conscious of not breaking that cold chain discipline mm. um, because they'll lose customers if they don't in the medium or short term mm. okay very good um i'm, I'm going to uh, answer a couple of quick slido questions here the first question there was uh, will a copy of the recording be available yes it will uh, it will be available on our website our website will remain live you'll be able to go to any of the previous uh, information um, and snapshots uh, that we have published. And there is another final snapshot to be published this week as well uh, as part of our closing down. So, yes, you will be able to see that. And and when you're at the website, I should also draw your attention to uh, some links to a lot of the reference materials uh, that have been used by the team to prepare a lot of this information. So. Uh, that information will still be there and still be available online for you. Uh, and then I want to go to the uh, to the to the number one uh, tracking question here on Slido. Uh, and uh, you know, thanks. Keep those questions coming. The, uh, Ten people have registered uh, interest in this particular question, and you know, so so there's a lot of interest there. Uh, demonstrates that people respond to that question specifically about. Uh, any plans uh, from Austrade to continue with the updates of the supply chain factors? Because the simple visual re uh, representation is very helpful to share with clients and also to keep up with Austrade fact uh, Australia's factors. So a couple of things that I'd just like to say there. One is that simple visual representation is the culmination of uh, an enormous amount of work by a very small, dedicated and talented team. Uh, and, and just uh, uh, a shout out to the team. Uh, so we've got uh, behind the scenes today, we've got Tob and Redmond, uh, we've got Annika Neal and, uh, and the visual genius of Max McMillan. Uh, we also have uh, a former colleague, I understand Patrick Orth has, has joined us today as well. Um, so a small uh, crack team have gone into producing all of this material, which looks profoundly simple, but it's not. Um, bottom line is, with uh, you know, and as 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 Michael has uh, has pointed out, we're back to a position where uh, we never thought we'd necessarily be back in such a good position. Um, it's unlikely that there's going to be big changes over the next um, 
um, you know, months and uh, hopefully things will years. progress. <laughs> years, hopefully, and, 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 and touch wood that we have no other um, um, major dislocations. But the simple answer to that question is we can't keep um, doing this with, you know, with budgets stretched by, uh, you know, limited budgets with, within government. Uh, we've, we've made the decision there's not much more that we can do here and, and, and you know, the, the, the time and cost associated with doing uh, doing this work is, you know, the, the money needs to be invested elsewhere to help deliver other priorities for the government. So, um, but thanks for your endorsement, everybody who's asking that question. Um, and, and also thank you to the team. Um, oh, and here's another one. Um, not a question, but a huge shout out to the ESCI team for their fantastic work over the past 12 months. Uh, we'll take that as a statement. Thank you very much. And, and, and uh, uh, I do echo those sentiments. Um, uh, a bit more of a technical question, perhaps another one here for you, Michael. Has there been any review or foresight into changes to the transport industry for decarbonisation? You kind of touched on this. Um, but oh, look, I think it's yeah. uh, it's very um, <laughs> it's the largest it's the largest emission sector for the nation. Yeah, it's, well, it's uh, look. Um, I was the the simple thing is: do you want to put do you do, does a does a a manufacturer want to put six batteries into an eight ton truck mm. that used to cost 75 grand, but with the six batteries will be a tonne and a half less than cost 200 grand. Or do you want to put one battery into an S600 and sell it for 500 grand in China? Mm. So you can work out which, there's only one company that has S-Class 600s. Mm. You can work out who that is, where the batteries go. The batteries are going to go at the moment to high-end cars mm. and high-end consumers and that market because there's more of a return. When you put batteries currently into trucks, um, you have to put a lot of batteries into a truck and then it reduces the weight, particularly over the steer. And with our ADR at 5.6 tonne or 5.8 tonne or whatever it is, I don't know off the top of my head, um, you're reducing your pay weight, but you're doubling the cost. Mm. So... I think that uh, electrification is a long way away. And if you read from the chief scientist of Daimler, which is the second largest or largest truck manufacturer in the world, uh, with uh, Mercedes-Benz, Freightliner, uh, Fuso, Western Star, uh, in that grouping, mm -hmm. um, he doesn't believe electrification uh, will be fully operational in Europe alone till 2039. Mm. He, he, look, re, look into, he, he did a great paper and speech. He's the chief scientist of Daimler on electrification. Mm. Now, everyone can talk about what they think is going to happen, mm. but uh, he might be a bit of a, more of an expert. Um, if charging stations, uh, there just aren't the charging stations being built for trucks. Um, I recently drove to Brisbane um, to go to a surf carnival. And um, if just outside of Ballina at that big service station on the left-hand side there, for that massive truck fleet and car fleet that there, there was three, there was three charging stations. Mm. Now, there's not actually a service station on the main road, on that highway, from once you leave Grafton. Mm. So one service station between Grafton and Ballina with three charging points. Mm -hmm. It ain't going to happen in the foreseeable future. Not only isn't it commercially viable, you lose too much weight, uh, it costs too much, and they're going to go to cars or Teslas or whatever they're going to do. There just isn't the infrastructure to make it efficient. And then that, we're a long way from full electrification of the commercial fleet. Yeah, right. Very good. Thanks. Uh, Greg Johnson asks, are there any specific markets or regions where there is notable growth or increased demand for air freight? And how is the supply chain adapting to meet those demands? Look, I think things have changed. Um, obviously, the big, big, big change is uh, seafood into China and also high-end vegetables into China. 
and then some other products in Asia. We've seen great growth. There's been great growth and real changes into North America, particularly for seafood out of the eastern seaboard. Um, we've seen enormous amount of change in uh, tuna that was going to China and Japan, which is, now goes to the US. Mm. Um, we've seen a lot of, obviously, with the big decisions made by different countries on their subsidies um, for lamb mm. uh, into the Middle East and the changes there because their budgets couldn't hold it. Mm. Our lamb producers have changed. Mm. Uh, high-end meat has changed uh, on where it goes. It was Some of that was going into... Uh, different parts of Asia. Now, a lot of our high-end meat tenderloin and so on is going to the US, but it's also going more onto those high-end plates in Japan and Singapore and top restaurants in Thailand, etc. So people have adapted a lot um, and, and, and tried to do really different things. And that was driven by uh, the difficulties in the Australian-Chinese relationship, and, and that's been well noted, and, and people did adapt. Uh, and you've seen that on most of those commodities, bar probably rock lobster, their production is higher. Maybe they're not they're getting the same price point, but they are getting actually more tons out. Yeah, it's the you know the, you, you're articulating exactly what we've been focused on within Australia, and that's helping diversification. Yeah. So, um, so it's good to see that working, and 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 you know we see it in the in the stats there. Kevin asks the next question: um, When this all started. Uh, indicated shipping companies took the opportunity to scrap uh, old ships and containers. You mentioned that this morning or, yeah. or just now as well. You indicated they'd be building new ones. This is still happening and what is and, and, and will and when will we and and will we see the benefits and when will these come on board? Yeah. So the largest shipbuilding program in the history of the world's underway at the moment. I don't know what the last Numbers what numbers were, but it was like uh, the last time I looked at it was about 6.4, 6.49 million TU tonnage capability. Mm. The five biggest ships in a row uh, were launched in June, mm. uh, week after week, for people just saying, I want to be bigger. They were around, they were mega ships at around 24,500 TU. I think they were nearly all Maersk and um, MSC ships. So there is enormous amount of capacity, a really big numbers uh, starting to roll off now. It's about three or four months later than we thought, but it is well underway and will be under, well underway for the next two, three, four years. What they are doing, though, they are scrapping the, uh, old ships, anything over 25 years, and they at the back end of COVID, they kept those ships because there was so much money in TU rates. But now that there's more suppression of volume and the IMO regulations, they are scrapping tonnage for tonnage. So new tonnage is coming in mm. with very efficient ships, very modern ships uh, that comply. They're scrapping the equal amount of tonnage nearly every day. Right. So there's not more tonnage coming in. Yeah. It's just newer and more efficient, more efficient and complying with the fuel regulations. The bigger ships goes to the... Muhammad here, Muhammad here asks the ships facing workforce shortages um, to the same extent as no. airlines. And, and not as much. Bigger ships, though, don't they need more people? No. So the bigger ships, are A, will never come here. We're a four to 7,000 TU market in the main. Every now and again we see a ten or 11,000 TU ship here. Um, only one berth technically is possible at uh, full loading based on depth and breadth and um, bridges, etc., etc., uh, for 14,000. But those mega ships, 25,000, don't run this route. These routes, they run uh, US West Coast or Europe. Uh, no, they don't um, have... They have less people per TU. They don't have less people now that for that ship. Mm. But most of those workforces are from the Philippines, Bangladesh, India. Mm. Uh, that is why there's always such a push from the MUA and the ITF on modern slavery. Mm. Um, those workforces from the big shipping lines are predominantly from those countries except for chief engineers, captains, and, and who are mainly Danes, Finns, and Russian or Ukrainian. Right. Interesting. 
Okay, very good. Uh, uh, another uh, Slido question here. Um, Greg Johnson also asks, based on the current state of the export supply chain for goods by air, what recommendations or actions would you propose to further optimise performance? Um, again, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't change what I said three years ago. Um, what did you say three years ago? You need a friend. <laughs> right, okay. Everyone is your friend. I, I know... Freight forwarding and logistics is historically incredibly cutthroat. Uh, I, I've been in it for 30 years. It's incredibly cutthroat and competitive. Um, but you need friends. That's one. While, whilst complying, obviously, with all the ACCC guidelines. Um, but consolidate, aggregate, then have deep relationships with people in your chain for manufacturers or producers, farmers, shippers, farmers, uh, you need fishermen, you need a greater understanding. I think that people before COVID left it for people mm. when it was three or four points in their P&L. Mm. They're only making four or five cents in the dollar then. So when logistics costs went to eight to 12 to 14, their margin's gone. Mm. But they didn't understand or understood enough the interplay of fuel, of labour costs mm. in that supply chain, mm. thinking that our supply, your own supply chain costs only in Australia and your part of the world in Brisbane are the most influential thing to your cost base, and they're not. Mm. We're an island mm. or a continent, depending on which school you did geography at. And we're interconnected. What COVID showed, well, we're only 1.8% of global TU trade and 2% of global air that everyone else influences us, not the other way around. So we have to be deeply immersed in what we need to learn here. Mm. And that is aggregate, consolidate, have friends, be consistent, be predictable, uh, and don't leave things to the last minute. Mm. So that, that's all about the supply chains. I'll just add to that yeah. too, Michael, but just by saying that it's not it's not only understanding that within your supply chain. I think, you, you know, in, in Austrade where our people in our offshore network are talking to the customers, yeah. you know, I think, uh, and if we can help through our networks, I, I, you know, invite anyone on the call to engage with us because you really need to build your relationship with your with your customer at the end of the day as yeah. well. All of those supply chain costs are, of course, critically important to both sides of the, the equation. So it's all about uh, you need friends. And so tell me, my friend, you, you've been doing this for 30 years. Yeah. Uh, three years ago, did you ever think we'd be in this kind of situation? When when it first started, uh, you, you know, and you, you were there at day one to help us stand up the international freight uh, adjustment mechanism, what surprised you most about the last three years? Um, I think there's two or three things that surprised me most, that people did adapt really quickly. Mm. Uh, logisticians and supply chain people uh, are not renowned for uh, adapting because mm. they like the structure, predictability and discipline. Mm. Um, but they had to adapt. Mm. So they adapted very quickly and very well for survival. Two, I think that... Hopefully people learnt, and I knew that anyway. I spent 20 years overseas, um, that Australia is at the end of the world and that well, you need to have a... If you want to be a good exporter or an importer, you have to have a really global view and understand what's happening everywhere else. Mm. Um, and what you do in your ABCO hut at Smithfield doesn't matter about your cost base that much if you're an exporter or an importer. Mm. Um, and then I think uh, the genuine goodwill of people to try to help each other. Mm. Uh, from a cutthroat, ruthless industry, people did actually try to help each other. Mm. And I think that's what got uh, most people through. Mm. Uh, now, everyone has to be very careful about that with the ACCC, but we need, we need to share learnings to make the system better all the time. A lot of things are not IP. Uh, they need to be shared in an ecosystem to make it more efficient. Mm. Mm. So what have you learnt? Yeah, <laughs> what have you learnt from well, 
the last three years of logistics being a diplomat for 30 years. Yeah, I haven't been a diplomat for 30 years, but I've been bureaucrat. in international business. So I haven't been a bureaucrat for, um, you know, wash your mouth. But, you know, but, uh, but actually, you know, having been in business and, in, and then in government, um, actually, that's probably what I noticed most as well, that the, the ability for us in, within Austrade, but all forms of government to be able to pivot so quickly, you know, when everything stopped... Um, you know, that's when the, you know, the government being able to, to quickly pivot and, and within Austrade, you know, stand up a team with your leadership and, and, and the leadership of Mark Stave and, and others to quickly help when the chips were down for industry. So that, that was, you know, that was surprising. That was, that was profound. And, and, you know, as an Austrader for, for the last 20 odd years, um, you know, it's frankly quite proud of the way that, that Austrade has been able to do these things and others to really help people diversify and, and adapt, uh, you know, quickly. So, um, you know, that, that's that been um, an interesting experience to, to be part of. Um, but if you had to do it all again, from what you've learned for the last three years, mm -hmm. what would you do differently? Well, I wouldn't have accepted the phone call from Simon Birmingham on a Friday afternoon when I'm walking to Miranda Pub, so that would be the first thing I would have said no. There you go. <laughs> because it was supposed to be for three months. So, um, look, what, what I don't have regrets of doing things and I don't look back. I think that um, probably, I think the team did a fantastic job with F rate. Mm. I think, I don't think the federal government, we put 1.1 billion into F rate. We ran nearly 28,000 or subsidised or contributed to 28,000 flights. Yeah, that's just We possible. moved some ridiculous amount of tonnage that would never have got out. And we kept supposedly 165,000 people in the job in rural communities. You have to remember what this was about at the very beginning, it was about making sure these rural communities didn't unwind. Yeah. Uh, because as we all know, once a rural, once the abattoir goes or the the major farmer goes or the feedlot goes or the fishing fleet goes, the school goes, the chemist goes, because those people have to go and look for a job and then those towns unwind really quickly and you can never get them back. Mm. So I think, though, we should have at one point probably got some more resources or pivoted some of the resources to think more deeply about sea freight. Mm. Um, there was no way we could have put money into that. It would have been a, an ocean of money. <laughs> <laughs> and we spent over a billion dollars as it was, and that would have been a drop in that ocean. Mm. But we could have understand understood the movements there mm. a little bit better, and particularly the pricing strategies of MERS, CMA, and MSC particularly. Mm. Well, I don't think you need to. I'm, I'm not going to hold you accountable for that. Cause, <laughs> cause, you know, it was never part of the remit. <laughs> no, it was never part of the remit. Yeah, we could have done that better. But, yeah. you know, what, what you and the team with, with IFAM and, uh, you know, what you achieved, you're right, it, it did save the nation. So thank, thanks for that. Um, yes. Well, what would you, my question to you, <laughs> have, I think, what do you, how do you think Austrade can help exporters? Yeah. Uh, going forward. So we've been on this journey, which was emergency. Yeah. Everyone's losing their jobs. They're, we, we, we were cutting down trees, particularly uh, in certain areas because we couldn't get the fruit away. So emergency. Then it was into a big part of education and stability. Mm. How do you think Austrade... Uh, continues with its mission to help exporters? Yeah, so Austrade's uh, you know, since 1933, Austrade's had a presence offshore, and 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 that's that's a big part of you know the benefit to Australia and Australian you know taxpayers. I think the fact that we've got that offshore network, and we can, you know, we've we've got our ear to the ground offshore to find out what opportunities there are. So we had to pivot quickly. You know, uh, it was not only the pandemic, but also the geopolitical impact on 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 our Australian exporters. So the ability to understand our markets through our offshore network and get that information back to us, you know, that was that was really important for us. And I think we've we've got a lot better over the last few years in understanding the intelligence. And in fact, you know, the export supply chains has been just that. It's gathering intelligence and synthesizing it and packaging it. So we're not necessarily doing it in supply chains, but you know, in any element of understanding 
you know, what the price of honey is in Delaware at the moment and, and whether it's going to be cost-effective to ship Manuka honey from, from Australia, compete against the New Zealanders to put, you know, the, the best quality product, we can help solve those problems and we'll continue to do that. So, so that's, uh, you know, that's really good. What's next? Um, so, apart from all my board hats, um, I think that there's a natural progression for me with the federal government. So I'm still staying a day or two a week with the federal government. Um, we, I came for an emergency, a disaster. I was staying three months. Then it took a little bit longer than three months. And then education. We got there in the end. We got there in the end, yeah. <laughs> um, I think the big thing which um, I would like to think that all exporters and importers are going to get uh, behind deeply and all people in the supply chain is the simplified trade system mm -hmm. task force review. I know people are now just pushed, uh, delete and hung up. Um, I know that it's gone on for 10 years. It's the third attempt at it. I've been involved once before on the other side where I said it wouldn't work. Um, but we are a trading nation. We are surrounded by water. We do make enough food for 73 billion people. There's only 26 million of us. Our way of life and our GDP and our per capita income is based on trade. One in five jobs are trade. A uh, trillion dollars nearly is trade. Yeah. Um, but because of a whole lot of reasons, our trade competitiveness and effectiveness has slipped from 11th or 12th, 12 years ago to 117th. Mm. So, and we feel that through the paperwork, we feel that through the documentation, we through, feel that through the lack of digitalisation and... I think that the next part is to uh, help that task force um, get a real business sense on what's needed. Mm. And uh, um, the paper, the consultation paper was released yesterday mm -hmm. um, on the uh, Simplified Trade Task Force website, and I'm sure that uh, Annika and Tom will put that up for people, on a consultation paper how to uh, make it simpler for uh, all parts of the supply chain and manufacturers, farmers, fishers, primary producers to uh, trade. Mm. We want them to trade mm. and more SMEs particularly to get into it. Mm. So I'm going to do that for the couple of days a week for the next six months to help them on their second pass business case, which goes to uh, my EFO at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully that will make the trading system uh, more important mm -hmm. and more efficient. Yeah, very good. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I might uh, just pass to you if you want to make some final comments there. Oh, my, fi my final comments are, are, are really simple. And uh, Please read the snapshot. We've got a bumper edition with lots and lots of detail coming out uh, on a whole lot of things. Um, I, I think the main thing is I would thank all of you. I think that uh, in really difficult circumstances, where a lot of people were close to losing their businesses, were close to going broke, uh, had were cutting down trees, were thinking what they do with their animals because they can't get them overseas, etc. That people's behaviour was really, really good. I think only once, maybe twice, I had to ring someone and say, don't ever behave like that again because we'll never speak to you. Mm. And in the, the depths of pressure... Uh, we didn't perform and behave like people in supermarkets with toilet paper. <laughs> that, uh, if you remember the idiocy of those things. When we spoke to thousands of people and trying to help them, their behaviour, their uh, courtesy, their uh, engagement was outstanding. Mm. And in the end, that's what all you have, mm. how you behave. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I'd like to thank everyone for that. Um, and then I'd like to thank uh, the people from who were at IFM. It was a very IFAM. There was a very small team, only about fifty six at any one time. This is even a smaller team, five five people. Uh, they've done an amazing job. People think that in government, and I did when I was out. So I think that they there be massive teams in government. They don't do anything and uh, they don't work hard and. And for my three years, I just found that not to be true, unfortunately. So I couldn't throw that stone anymore that um, we, we, we got out of over a billion dollars to support rural farmers, fishers, primary producers with 55 people. 
uh, we ran this with five people and four people and three people and yourself um, and gave real value to the taxpayer. And then Austrade, this was way outside of Austrade's original remit. But um, not only did it at the beginning reluctantly, but then decided to do it really well. Mm. So they should be congratulated as mm. well, I think. And yeah. that would be my closing comments. Good on you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. We've had over 250 uh, enrolled today. Thanks uh, to the team, Max, Annika, Tom, uh, Patrick, who's there as well. I don't know if Bianca Wheeler's on board as well, but thanks uh, uh, for the assistance over the year. Uh, that we've had export supply chain services. All of this material, the presentations, the, the recordings will all be on the website as well. Uh, we wish you well. Stay in contact with Austrade. Uh, what, uh, um, I just forgot the number, 132878. Uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll get you to Austrade any time. The supply chains uh, at austrade.gov.au will continue to be monitored. So thank you, everyone. And... Michael, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Job well done. Thank you. Bye for now. Thanks, guys. Oh, Annika Neil left. Yeah,